And uh, uh, we're hosting this event along with the help of the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation. So just before I invite up our first speaker, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what exercise is, is medicine is and uh, kind of the vision behind the speaker series. So Exercise as Medicine is a global health initiative that aims at getting physicians and other healthcare practitioners uh, more comfortable and encouraging them to increase exercise prescription in their, uh, in their patient plans. Um, exercise as Medicine is also focused on getting a referral system set up where physicians and healthcare practitioners can refer patients to exercise professionals and exercise programs. In Canada, Exercise as Medicine is uh, hosted by the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology, or CSEP. And one of the main ways that uh, CSEP, or uh, Exercise as Medicine in Canada, um, works is through the on-campus in, on initiative. And so here uh, is where our group kind of comes in. And so we started our group last February, and since then we've been working hard in order to bring the Exercise as Medicine ideals to the U of A campus. And so we've had kind of two main goals since we've started here, and that's been using knowledge translation and creating an interdisciplinary team. And so what knowledge translation is, is bringing the relevant research on exercise and medicine and bringing them to the relevant uh, members of the community. And then also the interdisciplinary team is creating a group on campus of the various health faculties and bringing them together to encourage exercise prescription. And so these two uh, goals that we, we started with kind of came together nicely with the Per Talks Moving for Medicine speaker series. And uh, that's kind of what we have going on here tonight. And we've been doing that with the support of the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation. And this is actually our second talk in the series. And so the vision for each talk is we bring in a phys ed and rec researcher and they come and talk about their research on how physical activity affects the treatment and management of a certain chronic condition. And then following each researcher, uh, we bring in guest speakers who can provide kind of an alternative perspective on the matter. And so, um, and then after following each, each series of talks, uh, we also open it up for a Q&A. And so we'll have that this evening. So if you could prepare any questions that you have and uh, just write them down and save them for the end, that would be excellent. And so the uh, goal of tonight, uh, the question that we're looking at is uh, exercise for type 2 diabetes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so our first speaker, who I'll invite up in just a moment, is uh, Dr. Norman Boulet. And uh, Dr. Boulet is an associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Phys Ed and Rec, a member of the Alberta Diabetes Institute, and the director of the Physical Activity and Diabetes Laboratory. So if you could all please join me in welcoming up Dr. Norman Boulet. Thanks, Ryan, and, and thank you all for being here. It's great thanks to the organizing committee. I know they work very hard at rounding up speakers, making sure we're on time, at sharing slides and doing those things. So it's a nice initiative on campus that, that I really appreciate. Um, as a professor in, uh, in, in the faculty, I've had a, a few opportunities uh, to come in and talk in different classes about physical activity and diabetes. And when I'm talking to undergraduate students, I typically start with a little bit of background, typical definitions, what is diabetes, what is hyperglycemia. I'd have heavy slides that I won't go through this time talking about plasma glucose concentrations for diabetes, pre-diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, normal glucose tolerance, hypoglycemia. But um, it was actually in, in, in some of the work with the Alberta Diabetes Institute. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Monday was uh, World Diabetes Day. Uh, the Institute had two young guests with type 1 diabetes visit and we had to, to they, they were researchers for a day and uh, with a 7 year old and an 11 or 12 year old I had to maybe simplify things a little bit, give a different perspective and I thought this would be nice, it might help you remember things more than, than the previous slide here. But if you look in a typical textbook you'll see you've got about 5 liters of blood. Those are five one liter bottles there to give you an idea of how large it is. And, you know, we've all seen how many teaspoons or tablespoons of sugar there is in a Coke, a yogurt, a muffin, but maybe I haven't been thought about it how much sugar we have in, in our blood. Well, a non person who doesn't have diabetes would typically have about a teaspoon of glucose in their five liters. Okay? 
And that's actually sucrose there. I, uh, sorry for the, the difference. And it's probably more than a teaspoon. The teaspoon shouldn't be that big, but it had a nice sprinkling effect. I thought it would fit in nicely for my slides. Um, if you're looking for the cutoff for, for hypoglycemia, oh, just half a teaspoon and you'd be approaching definitions for, for hypoglycemia. The definition for hypoglycemia is quite controversial and there are other factors, but about half a teaspoon. And type two diabetes or diabetes, two teaspoons. So I bring that up to, 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 to show how tightly regulated glucose is. It's an important variable. Right now, sitting down, your brain is consuming lots of glucose. If you've had a meal, glucose is coming in. We can store glucose. There's lots of different factors at play here, but we need to control this very tightly because too high or too low glucose can be life-threatening. Um, some of you have taken exercise physiology class. You've probably talked about muscle glycogen and grams and things like that, but put things in perspective, a typical adult can store 100 teaspoons of glucose in their muscle. All right, compared to that uh, one teaspoon that we normally have in our blood. So thinking of this way, you can think, well, yeah, there might be lots to do between exercise and diabetes and, and some potential roles. And so we're going to focus on type 2 diabetes today. Um, you know, the non-modifiable risk factors that you may have heard of for type 2 diabetes, things you can't change, such as age, your parents, very early life events, and so on and other things that you may be able to modify a bit. Uh, not all fat, but some forms and types of fat may be a, a risk factor, and some lifestyle behaviors. We'll start with two studies, which I would put maybe in the category of, 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 of good news. Um, this first one here is the Diabetes Prevention Program. If you search diabetes, exercise, this is probably the most cited study in, in the area. It's, it's getting a few years old already now, but it's a, it's a nice one where they randomly assigned over 3,000 people. These are people who have pre-diabetes, all right? So somewhere between the normal and, and the diabetes range. At risk of developing diabetes, I'll draw your attention first to the blue placebo curve, and that'll give you an idea of, of, of the risk of having pre-diabetes. You see nicely that for every year, there's about a 10%, 10% of that group that's developing type 2 diabetes. So four years later, you see about 40%, 40% of them all right, have developed diabetes. I won't talk about metformin right away. I'll bring it back up later. But if you talk about a lifestyle intervention, and, and it's unfortunate for today's talk, it would have been nice if it was just about exercise. But this is a weight loss, reduce fat in the diet, and exercise. The exercise goal was to reach 150 minutes of, of physical activity per week. Of all the three goals, this is the one that was reached the most. Um, but you see there was actually a 58% reduction in the development of diabetes with a lifestyle intervention. So lots of type 2 diabetes can be prevented. And just reaching the physical activity goal, not reaching the weight loss goal, not reaching the other goals, was uh, associated with uh, substantial reductions. Another series of studies uh, show some of the benefits here that we're switching not to pre-diabetes, but what if you already have diabetes and you're looking at exercise? There are dozens of sh studies showing the benefits on glycemic control. Uh, the primary outcome is often HbA1c, sometimes it's called A1c or glycated hemoglobin. That just simply for today's purposes, think of it as reflecting your average glucose values for the last two to three months. So it's a very important clinical indicator of how well controlled your diabetes is. And a lot of these meta-analyses and studies show some benefits. I want to maybe just emphasize one today uh, that, that we've worked on. At the time, it was the largest study, so still not that large, 251 participants with type 2 diabetes. At the time, it was the largest exercise trial in diabetes, but I like it for a few reasons, mostly because it had different types of exercise and you can see some, some pretty uh, neat things here. If we focus right away maybe to on the blue squares, right, aerobic exercise, they would do three times 15 minutes in a week and you can see their glycated hemoglobin go down compared to the control here in red within three weeks and then it starts to not decrease as quickly afterwards. So improvements that stabilize out. 
When you looked at resistance training in green, it was no different than the control group for the first three months, but then caught up to the aerobic training where there was no statistical difference uh, between aerobic and resistance training. It would have been interesting to follow another three months or a, a year of training to see if the resistance training would have overtaken them. But what's nice is oftentimes we don't, if you do twice as much, get twice the benefit. That not always, doesn't always happen. If they were to do twice as much aerobic training, they probably would not have gotten twice the benefit. But the effects of resistance training, so this is something like lifting weights or using uh, machines at, at a gym that have a, a heavy resistance. Combined with aerobic training, you got both the benefits early on, probably mostly due to aerobic training, got some benefits, and then after the effects of resistance training kicked in. And you had a really substantial improvement in A1C compared to the control group. That is comparable, if not better, than you know, a lot of these medications that are added for the treatment of diabetes. So you can get some substantial improvements in glycemic control. So that, I would say, is pretty good news, both in terms of prevention and, and, and management of diabetes. I hate to, to, to use the term bad. I, I admit that I was encouraged to, to, to use a provocative title to get you to come out here today when I said the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and I'll look, now talk about the Look Ahead study, which in many ways is a great study that shows uh, lots of very interesting things. There's probably over 100 papers published from this Look Ahead study. But as, a, as an exercise person, when I talk to others and about the benefits of exercise, I often get told, well, what about the look ahead study? Wasn't that a bad study? Uh, or uh, showed uh, that exercise doesn't work? Well, it, it had a big splash in the media. This is a, a large NIH funded study that was actually stopped before the end because it was looking like there was no way that exercise was going to be beneficial for the outcome of preventing something that's more meaningful than someone's glycated hemoglobin, but if they were going to have a heart attack, a stroke, and, and things like that. So they, they, they stopped the trial because if you look at the graph here, the, the risk of having a heart attack, a stroke, they even added uh, hospitalization for angina because they weren't getting many events in, in both groups. But you see there, maybe early on, it looked like they were gonna separate the intervention here, which is lifestyle, very similar to the diabetes prevention program, weight loss, calorie restriction. Uh, this time was 175 minutes of exercise. Maybe it looked like it was separating out, but by the end of the 10-year study here, there was no difference in your risk of having a heart attack, a stroke. That's probably contrary to what you learn in your, in your classes and that we teach you all the time in our faculty in terms of the, the benefits of physical activity for preventing cardiovascular disease. So let's take a look a little closer of, of what happened here. Well, it might not be all that bad. If you look at some outcomes, so I've, I've highlighted in the upper left, it's hard to see there, but that's body weight. Uh, and in the bottom right, that's glycated hemoglobin again. You'll see in the first year some pretty dramatic improvements. Right, the weight loss, probably not due to exercise itself, but to the uh, caloric restriction. Um, improvements in A1C, very similar to what I was telling you before. But as we know, with most lifestyle interventions, they're hard to sustain. There's uh, going to be a decrease in adherence over time. And so things gradually bounce back up. Looking at the control group, you might be a little surprised too. Control group seems to improve at least for weight for, for a little while, maybe a little bit for glycemic control. And if I show you the next slides, you'll probably be even more surprised. I've highlighted in the upper left, diastolic blood pressure, and in the lower right, um, LDL cholesterol, other risk factors for heart attacks and strokes. Um, what happens in the uh, lifestyle group is a bit different than the previous slide. Um, there are improvements here in white that seem to be sustained. Uh, improvements in LDL that keep on going despite weight going back up and other things, adherence going down. But what's even su more surprising is if you look at the control group which only received standard education, by the end of the four years here the standard education group was actually doing better in terms of their LDL than, uh, than the exercise and diet group. Why in the world would a control group be doing better? Well, it's not ethical to bring people into a 10-year trial 
and say, oh, by the way, you're in the control group and you're not allowed to change your medication. So their family physicians could still change their medications. And that's what they saw. They saw an increase in statins, an increase in blood pressure lowering medication, um, uh, an increase in glucose lowering medication in the control group. Okay, so it's, it's a confounder. So there are all sorts of other confounders. Not everyone responded the same. I think I'm, I'm getting a little bit over on time um, if I keep at this pace. So I decided to skip over this slide. I do want to talk also about the remission of, of people going away, who had diabetes who no longer had diabetes, but I'll skip over this slide as well. If you have questions about that, we can address it in the question and answer period. Right, here's another series of uh, findings that I'll, I'll put in the bad category, but I don't want you to go home thinking exercise, metformin together is bad. That's not the point. It's just maybe not as good as what we, sometimes we might have expected. Right? Exercise has tons of benefits, metformin has some benefits, but our group uh, has looked at this a little bit more closely. Very few groups actually look at how, how best to combine exercise with other interventions. A little bit of quick background on metformin. It's considered with lifestyle a first line therapy for diabetes. Right? It is Amazing to see how often this medication is prescribed. It's in the top 10. It's up there with statins, blood pressure medication, uh, antidepressants, pain medication. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big player in, in, in that industry. Um, it's considered for prediabetes, polycystic ovary syndrome, obesity, some forms of cancer. There's probably 100 trials going on right now with metformin and cancer and, and, and others. A few years ago, I was thinking they'd be adding it to the drinking water soon. That's how it seemed to be, it seemed to be everywhere. It's very, very popular. Uh, but Apart from my, our group, there's probably just one other group that looked at these types of things uh, closely, a group in the U.S. looking at interactions between metformin and exercise. We gave uh, metformin to athletes in some studies. We gave to people with diabetes who weren't treated with metformin. Um, we gave it to in training studies, uh, lots of different things. I'll just show you perhaps the last one here um, because I think visually it, it, it's nice and summarizes some of our results. A study that we used with continuous glucose monitoring, that's the little device you see in the upper right. It's like thick, like three, is the size of three loonies piled up on each other. And, and I know with the bright lights due to the filming, it's hard to see. But if you look right around here, there's a little thin flexible filament that is placed into your adipose tissue and, and, and collects interstitial, so the fluid uh, around the cells there and, and measures continuously over six days over a week your glucose concentrations. There's a slight difference between interstitial and plasma glucose but they're, they're very very strongly correlated. And so what we did, we brought people into the lab for about five hours. Uh, in blue here you have the control or rest day. Um, we gave them breakfast, we gave them lunch, we sent them home with a few meals Right, not everyone ate at the exact same time. That's why there's a bit of a, we put a break in the data there to make it all these sections starting with, with meals. And if you compare a rest day to an exercise day in these, in these people treated with metformin, this is what you see. As you probably have been taught or as you'd expect during exercise, we're consuming glucose. These people with diabetes, their glucose will go down. Uh, close to five in the very normal r range, so, so, so that's good news, right? But if you follow them for the next day with these continuous glucose monitors, you'll see these peaks of hyperglycemia after meals increasing even more. So which normally we'd expect glucose to lower with exercise, the 24-hour average did not change, and perhaps concerning is these peaks of hyperglycemia uh, c uh, occurred. Again, I'm not telling you if you have metformin, if you're treated with metformin, not to exercise. If you're exercising regularly, there's other benefits, there's training benefits, and, 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 and it's not that bad. But what I'm saying is that there are ways of actually better combining medications together uh, and, and exercise, and that's something that our lab is, is looking into. Okay, the last part, the ugly. Um, this is not where I do my research. 
This is more anecdotal stuff, but I think it's concerning stuff. I know a lot of you in the audience are interested in, in behavior modification, in, in promoting physical activity, and I just wanted to, to maybe share some of my thoughts, some of the concerns, some of the things that I run into that I think are, are areas that, uh, that we should work on and address. <coughs> Number one, um, I, I hear this often from participants who volunteer for our exercise studies or training studies. I know I've, I've tried exercise before, but it doesn't work for me. I didn't lose any weight. I stopped. They're expecting to lose 10, 20, 30 pounds, and that's not the reality. Our trials show that if there is weight loss with our typical exercise interventions, it's very small, often in the range of a couple pounds. Okay? <coughs> and even if it's a small weight loss, there are benefits in fitness, benefits in glycemic control, and many other benefits. Fear of hypoglycemia and other risk. I have diabetes, maybe it's dangerous for me to exercise. Some of those fears may be legitimate. Right? People with type 1 diabetes, um, people with advanced type 2 diabetes treated with insulin, there may be some concerns in, in some cases of hypoglycemia. I don't want to downplay them, they, they do exist. But there's some misinformation. A lot of people who just go to perhaps you know, general diabetes education clinics or get information from others or in the media may feel that they shouldn't exercise if they have diabetes. It could be a risk factor for hypoglycemia. All right, so, uh, for, and and for, for, for most people, that's not the case. We often have great guidelines, great recommendations, but that uh, can induce pain, can be problematic for a lot of people with, with diabetes who have lots of other comorbidities at times. There are a lot of costs, gym memberships, getting to places, exercise equipment, and um, you know, diabetes is a disease that um, is overrepresented in, in areas with lower socioeconomic status, so, so it's, a, it's an important barrier. There's lots of stigma associated with a disease that's considered a, a lifestyle disease, right? But a lot of people with type 2 diabetes eat better than I do, exercise, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, it, it's, they're, but there's guilt and stigmatization that all are barriers that I think we can improve on to make uh, physical activity more accessible. So in summary, um, I'd say exercise is a cornerstone for the prevention and the management of type 2 diabetes. Lots of strong benefits. It's not all about glucose, that's what I'm interested in, but there's a lot of other outcomes that are important. And they may or may not be affected by exercise, but we shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, be too affected by studies like the look ahead that showed no reduction in cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, there are some problems. And exercise responses will vary depending on what medications people take, uh, depending on their, their background and who they are. So I, I will leave you on that note, but uh, first, uh, before I do, I just I clearly want to thank all the participants who uh, have participated in our studies. I see some in the room. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we provide a lot of really uh, invaluable information. Graduate students who work hard to collect that data. I see a few of you in the room as well. Uh, the Faculty of Physical Education and Recreation, very supportive for the development of our lab, the Alberta Diabetes Institute, and the Alberta Diabetes Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, we have uh, one of our former founding members, uh, Jordan Reese, and she's going to talk a bit about the experience of a grad student. And so uh, Jordan is a uh, grad student in Dr. Boulay's lab, and so she's going to talk a bit about her experience working with uh, the population of, uh, of uh, type, two, type 2 diabetes and kind of uh, how this has been a, a new, new step for her in uh, her education and career. All right, Jordan, everyone. Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> My name is Jordan Reese. Thank you so much for coming today. It's an awesome turnout. Um, today I'll just be speaking a little bit about my experiences working with uh, a type 2 diabetes population as a new graduate student. So coming from an undergrad recently transitioning into my graduate studies and part of the learning curve that's come along with that. So I'll give you a quick background about myself. And then I'll talk a little bit about my thesis project, uh, just to give you some context as to where I've gained my experiences from. And then I'll get into some of the surprises and challenges that I've faced along the way working with a new population group. Okay. 
So uh, my academic path is definitely not being a straight and narrow one. It's kind of taken some curves along the way. I didn't start my undergrad until I was 23 years old. So I started at Camosun College and I graduated there with a degree in exercise and wellness in 2015. So a recent undergraduate. Uh, during my time there, I really uh, developed a passion for physical activity and how it can be used as a preventative tool or management tool for many people with chronic diseases. So after I graduated, I decided to do my CEP certification, which I thought would allow me to work with a wider uh, population group, so people with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes kind of jumped out at me as I found the pathophysiolo pathophysiology of it quite fascinating. And I also have family members uh, who have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. So that kind of, uh, that combination drew me to that area. So I thought I had a fairly solid knowledge base. Uh, I knew a lot about the background of type 2 diabetes, but one key ingredient was missing. And that is experience. So coming into my undergrad, or my graduate studies, I had very little experience working with the type 2 diabetes population. So I'll talk a little bit today about how the learning curve has been for me. It's quite steep. So to give you some context to where I've gained my experience, uh, my thesis project that I'm working on is called the Exercise Physical, Act Physical Activity and Diabetes Glucose Monitoring Protocol. So it's a bit of a mouthful e-paradigm for short. Uh, it's a multi-site study, so it's been done across seven different universities in Canada. So we're looking to get a very large sample size of about 70 people. So to put that in perspective, a lot of exercise studies just have around 8 to 20 participants. So we're really looking to get a large sample size. And we're looking at how a single bout of exercise, so 50 minutes of walking, how it affects glucose control in the 24 hours following the walking bout. So if you times 50 by 3, you get 150 minutes. So our Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines is 150 minutes of moderate to vig vigorous physical activity a week. So if participants are doing this three days a week, then they're meeting uh, the Canadian Guidelines. So study inclusion criteria is quite broad, looking for people with a type 2 diabetes diagnosis between the ages of 30 and 90, so quite a wide age range. Uh, they can't have any contraindications to exercise, so things like excessively high blood pressure or resting heart rate. They cannot be taking insulin, and they must be able to walk for 50 minutes continuously. They must be able to comply with our study requirements, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. And they must also have a stable weight, so we classify this as no changes greater than 5 pounds in the last 3 months. So to give you an idea of what is required of the participants in our study, uh, this is a timeline. It's a six-day protocol. So it's nothing too complex. It's fairly simple. It's not like an exercise training study where we're asking participants to come in uh, for 12 weeks, three times a week. They just come in for a one-week period, and they come into our lab three times during the six-day protocol. So Norm talked a little bit about uh, continuous glucose monitors. They come in on a Monday and we insert that monitor. Quick visit, it's about 20 minutes. Uh, the following day they come in, it's a Tuesday, and they complete their walking condition or a seated control. And then on the Friday they come in and complete the opposite condition. So in a randomized crossover design. Uh, they also consume standardized meals on four of these days. So we're providing them with breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks and they must consume these for four days. So now that you have an idea of where I've gained some of my experience working with type 2 diabetes, I'll talk a little bit about what has surprised me and what has been challenging uh, as I've worked on this project. So perhaps the best place to start is talking about recruitment for the study. So I was uh, setting out to recruit 12 participants in May. So far, uh, we've recruited eight that have completed the protocol. So I was lucky enough to get a list of 180 people with type 2 diabetes, so I've been phoning them, and I probably talked <clears throat> to about 100 individuals, and out of that, eight people have completed the protocol. So I'll break it down a little bit into a few categories as to why people may or may not be able to participate in the study. So A, people don't want to participate, whether they're eligible or not. That's totally fine. Participation is 100% voluntary. 
Um, B, people would like to participate, but they aren't eligible. And this is surprisingly a lot of people, I've found. Uh, C, people who kind of want to participate, maybe they come into the lab and then they end up dropping out. And then D, people who really want to participate and they have completed the protocol. So I'll just jump right into B, people who would like to participate but they aren't eligible. So the first one up there is people who are taking insulin. Um, as a new graduate student, I was quite surprised with how many people with type 2 diabetes are on insulin. Often people think um, type 1 diabetes is associated with insulin and they don't really associate type 2 with insulin. So that was something that surprised me. And generally these participants have been older, so 70 years or greater. So perhaps they've had diabetes for quite a long time. The medication that they're on isn't being effective anymore, so they're put on insulin. So it's just excluded quite a few people from the study. The next one is a major one as well, not able to walk for 50 minutes. So when I'm talking to people on the phone, I ask them a few questions and I ask if they think they'd be able to walk for 50 minutes. And man many people say they can't for various reasons. Uh, some may have uh, lower extremity injuries or comorbidities like osteoarthritis, which makes it very difficult for them to complete 50 minutes of continuous walking. Uh, also, stable weight. So this has excluded quite a few females uh, experiencing weight fluctuations, whether it's gaining weight or losing weight. Uh, we're looking for half males and half females, and this has been a major um, challenge in finding females as their weight has been fluctuating. So perhaps some people struggling with weight management as well. So category C, kind of want to participate but end up dropping out. So this has been a challenging category for myself. Uh, it's quite time consuming talking with participa participants, emailing back and forth, setting up times to, for them to come into the lab. Many end up coming in and they're interested in participating but for some reason something comes up and they end up dropping out. So some of the reasons why perhaps they're not able to um, comply with our study requirements. They find it quite difficult to stick to the standardized meals that we're giving them. Or it's quite difficult for them to come in to our lab at specified times. So their schedule is kind of all over the place. And then another one that kind of surprised me was transportation to and from labs. So uh, we reimburse all our participants with uh, parking fees and transit passes. So, but some people find it hard to get enough money to make it to the lab, even though we do reimburse them. So that has excluded a few people or ended up, uh, resulted in a dropout. So thinking about maybe some of the different socioeconomic status of this population group. And then D, people who really want to participate and have completed the protocol. So within the eight people that have so far completed, it's been quite a broad spectrum of people. Um, there's some people who have come into our lab a few times in the past, they've already completed exercise studies and they're maybe the keeners. So they're into exercise, they like to learn more about it, so they sign up for an exercise study. It makes sense. There's also some people who have never participated in a study and they're quite sedentary. So we've really had a broad spectrum of people, which is nice so far in the study. So just uh, some food for thought before I finish up here. Uh, many participants that I've talked to during uh, my time working with them have said it's not easy to manage their disease. So a lot of people are perhaps struggling with the diet and the exercise side of things. So as, as exercise professionals, how can we provide effective services, programs to meet the needs of this population group? Things that are accessible, uh, affordable, and they're able to comply with. So perhaps a mixed method approach is the best approach to take. So it's so easy to focus on the exercise physiology side of things and forget about maybe more of the qualitative side of things. So behavioral changes, some of the things that people seem to be struggling with a little bit. So with one comes the other. Thank you for listening and thank you to Exercises Medicine on campus for organizing this event.